The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. It is Thursday. I never know what the date is. Uh, <laughs> it's Thursday and it's, what are we, like the 13th of June? It's somewhere around in there. Um, and uh, we're at the Warner Center and this is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And we're thrilled to be here with you. We've got a great show for you and I'm really excited to be here. I'm a little distracted because I was just looking at some of the questions that came in and somebody had asked, how do I lo log into the live broadcast? I'm gonna assume that you watch this recorded on YouTube. So I'm gonna, uh, cause otherwise it's like my head was going, but uh, if we're in the live broadcast, I can't tell you if you don't know how to be there right but I'm gonna assume that you watch it recorded so for those of you who want to know how to do that the live broadcast we are live Monday through Friday uh, there's a little asterisk after that between the eight uh, between the hours of 10 to noon and during that time we pump out a live feed uh, that goes to several different places it goes to Facebook it goes to YouTube it goes to Twitter and it goes to Periscope live on those days. Now, um, sometimes is it recorded live? Yes. Um, the days that we are absolutely almost always live, and again, there's always asterisk, right? But usually we're live, live, live on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, but we are live, live, live sometimes on Mondays and sometimes on Fridays. It just sort of depends on what else is going on. But usually Wednesday and Thursday are our production days when we do a live show and then we record a live show immediately afterwards to be sent out live on those days. Does that make sense? Um, but when we can't do things on those days, we do them on other days. So um, it's never the same, but that's, uh, and the way that you can see it is by going to any one of those sites at that time. So it's 10 o'clock Pacific time. Um, and then it goes till 11 o'clock Pacific time. So hopefully that will help you to figure out. And then of course, uh, it podcasts itself to, it will stay on Facebook and then it podcasts uh, also to YouTube and to iTunes. Um, and uh, you can, it's a free download uh, and available for you then. I've asked Traven uh, to show you some of the ways that you can get in contact with us and he's already showing those to you. I wanna remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com and when you go there, uh, lots of things to do. You can watch the live show when it's live. There's a button on top that says live and it has the red dot. Um, so you can watch it there as well. Um, but you can see all the highlight clips underneath as well and they're categorized in different ways. So sometimes it's by the topic, sometimes it's by the what we call the author, the speaker, um, and so on and so forth. And at the bottom of that page, there's a little button that says chat. And if you click that button, it opens up into a small box that allows you to type what you want to say. That comes in on my screen. And then you and I can have a conversation. But more importantly, you can have a conversation with the experts that we have on the show. And we do have a lot of experts that are on the show. Uh, we try as much as possible to bring you experts because here's why. Um, you know, I am not one of the experts. Let's be clear about that. Um, I'm a mom, a, a very grateful autism mom and a former teacher. And um, I remember when my child was diagnosed and I would, eventually I got on some mailing lists, you know, and I found out about these conferences and they would have these experts that were coming and I would think, wow. And they would say the topic, you know, teaching your child how to swallow pills. And I would think, 
I want my child to know how to swallow pills so that I'm not grinding pills up all the time. Uh, you know, and, and that's just one topic out of a million, right? I would think I'd like to be at that. And they would say, you know, the, uh, the author of a book would be standing there saying, I'm going to be speaking at this conference and I'm the person who wrote this book, right? And, um, and I, I remember there was one conference in particular that I just really wanted to go to and I called and it was like $220 and it was being held someplace that was three hours away from where I lived and it was going to be an all day into the night thing. And I remember thinking, I'd really like to go to that, but how does somebody go to that? How on earth? And I want the benefit for my child of whatever that expert is talking about, but I, I don't have that many hours. Where are these people's children and how, do they, how are they affording this? Like, I just couldn't figure it out. So uh, when I had the opportunity to host a show, I said, I want to have experts on and I want to make sure that it's available for free at all hours of the night and day. So that for the mom in Kansas who puts her child to bed and she can't get him to bed until 2.30 because that was me, right? Uh, I wasn't in Kansas, but I was putting my bed at, uh, uh, kid to bed at 2.30 when he was finally asleep. And that was when I had 10 minutes. And, and I would think, boy, I bet there's no college class about how to do this, uh, do this intervention and be the best mom that I can be at 2.30 in the morning. And there wasn't. I don't know if there is now, but here's the thing. And this is not a college class, right? You don't have to pay for it. Nobody's going to grade you. And there are no papers that are due. But we want to provide you the information as if you were going to a college class and give you that interaction so that if you want to ask questions. That's the whole reason why that exists. Because... I so desperately wanted that, and I know that some of you um, have written in and told us that that's really helpful to you. So uh, I hope that you will take advantage of the show in whichever way that you can, because you know what I always say, si se puede. We can do it if we hold hands, right? And I'm right here, reach out, hold my hand, ask a question. Um, I, I know that we've had a couple of questions that are for clinicians, and I don't have a clinician for you today. So those are going to have to wait. I will try to answer them separately. And we had somebody who wrote in specifically asking a question about a client who's heavy breathing as an automatic reinforcement. So I for sure want to get you a clinical answer on that, but I don't have an email to email you back. So if you would do me the favor of sending me your email, then I can get back to you quicker. Uh, there was somebody else who sent me a question that was clinical in nature, and I've already messaged them back. See, so how that, that's how that works. You don't ever have to give us your information, but otherwise the only way I can answer is within, in the context of the show, and sometimes you have to wait until I can get the expert who can answer that. I think I hope that makes sense, and if it doesn't, write back to me, and we'll we'll recover it. So it's Thursday, and you know on Thursday we like to kick off the show with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what are those experts talking about, and what does this have to do with me, and ultimately how can this help me to get to the progress that I want for me or for my family member and and can we do it as quickly and efficiently and inexpensively as possible right that's where the jargon comes in we like to start with the um, work the actual definition right um, which is often like so convoluted that we can't make sense of it if we're not experts and a lot of us are not. And then we give you a working definition, which often makes our experts a little bit mm, crazy. But uh, we have to have a way of getting a way in, right? So uh, Traven is showing you that today's term, there's by Carol Narrell. Uh, tomorrow you're going to see us talking about Carol Narrell a little bit. Uh, so uh, our term for today is escape maintained behavior. And this is a phrase that you will hear people use, escape maintained behavior. What does that mean? So let's go to our actual definition, which is one of those definitions that I really love where we just rearrange the words in the, the thing that we're trying to define. Behavior that is maintained by the ability to escape. There we go. Escape maintained behavior is behavior that is maintained by escape. Hmm. You know, if you didn't know what escape maintained behavior is, are you any closer? Right? This is my whole, I'm like, let's use different words. Can we use different words? So let's move on to our working definition because this is a pretty, we're all pretty familiar th with this. This is things we do to get out of doing something and it works, right? 
So first, I'm going to put this in a context of us, like things that we do to get out of something else. And it could be anything, right? You might be feeling something that you don't want to feel. And so you eat something, right? And then instantly you're not having that feeling. And then that's escape, maintain behavior. You will continue doing that because it worked. It, it got you out of feeling the way that you felt, right? Um, I always think about with our kiddos, the example of the kiddo who doesn't really want to take a bath, right? And so right before taking, you know, we say it's time to take the bath and we try to make it all fun and we, we go to the bathroom and the kid sees the bathtub and they have some fears about it. And so the kid throws a tantrum and lays down on the floor and kicks and screams and whatever. Now you have to deal with a tantrum, which means... They won because they're not in the bathtub. Do you see how that works? And as long as I know that if I throw a tantrum outside the bathtub, you delay the getting into the bath for even two minutes, I'm going to do that, right? If I really don't like the bath, it's working for me, right? There are tons of ways. I Honestly, I think the best example of escape maintained behavior are autism parents because there's a lot of stuff that we go, oh, I just can't do that. And so we find a way out of it. Now, is it normal and natural to want to have a way out of something? Yes, 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 yes. And we find ourselves when we're on the other side of it and we're like, just do it, right? And why do we have to go through the tantrum every time there's a bath and you know, right? Um, and we get frustrated with that, just do it. but. When does that ever work? Saying to people, well, you just need to suck it up, buttercup, right? Um, I, you know, me and taxes, boy, ugh, <laughs> I really don't want to do the taxes every year. It's not my favorite thing. And everybody says, well, take it to an accountant. You see, that's not the part that I don't like. Uh, the, the part I don't like is when you have to get the receipts together. And you have to do that whether you go to the accountant or not. So that's what I'm trying to escape. And for me, as long as I can put it off, the better, right? And it works for me because I get the reprieve from it. Yeah, does it come back to bite me? Then I'm up, the, you know, in the middle of April, which is, you know, a busy time for autism, right? When you're trying to cover autism and suddenly I'm having to do the taxes, right? So I want you to think about, first of all, what do you do to avoid doing things that you don't want to do? And does it work? Does it work for even a minute? Because this is the thing about escape, maintain behavior. If it works for a minute, we're going to keep doing it, right? And what are the ways that stop you from doing that? Well, one thing that stops people from doing that is when the consequence becomes so difficult, you stop avoiding the thing that you were escaping, right? Or you learn something new that helps it to not be so aversive, or you stop getting the reprieve if when, you know, I'm going to use myself as the example, if when I was feeling anxious and I ate, if it didn't take away the feeling of being anxious, eventually I would stop eating um, to try to avoid because it's not working, right? So for the example with the bathtub, with the kiddo who throws the tantrum to get out of getting in the bathtub, it really becomes important for us to A, teach them ways to ask for a break beforehand, to work on whatever aspect of the bathtub is aversive to them. It might be that we need to make the water colder or warmer. Um, it might be that we need to make more fun toys in the bath, right? Um, or it might be that when they start the tantrum, we pick them up and while they're freaking out, we make sure they're safe and don't put so much water in that they're, you know, there's any potential for drowning, but they go right into the bathtub tantrum or not. Because if tantruming doesn't put a pause on getting in the bath, eventually I'm going to stop doing that, right? So there are lots of different ways that we want to help a person. We don't want to just be like, get over it. We also don't want to just do the hardcore thing um, for some circumstances where we think that there's a sensory issue or an anxiety issue or a fear issue. Uh, one of the great examples that I have in my life was that my son learned, smart boy, we would sit down to do homework 
and we would get, we'd do all the homework and he enjoyed a bunch of the homework, we'd get to the math homework, right? And he, what he would do is he would drop his pencil on the floor because he by accident did that once and then he got down on the floor and was on the floor and started, you know, doing something on the floor and he realized that my attention wandered and that it took me a minute to be like, hey, what are you doing down there? Come on, let's finish homework, right? So we learned, ah, when my pencil drops, I have an excuse to go to the floor and I'm gonna get at least a minute out of this, right? And then he started milking it further. So he would like try to crawl away and get at one of his stuffed animals and, you know, do something. Because we're talking this was kindergarten, first grade, right? So now it became a thing where he wouldn't just drop the pencil. He would take the pencil and, and go like this and be like, oops, right? <laughs> like early acting class for my, for my son. Oops. And then he would have to go across the room to get it, and there would be his Buzz Lightyear toy right next to it, which then he would start to play with, right? And now it takes me a minute to get out of the chair and go over and bring him back because I'm not as agile as I once was, right? So he was getting a couple of minutes out of it. And then I went, oh, we got a problem here. And it was made clear to us that we couldn't have that gap, that if he dropped a pencil, that he didn't get to pick it up, I had to have this ginormous cup of sharpened pencils on the table, and as soon as he went like this, another pencil was put in his hand, and his hand was put on the paper, and I'd go, look, we're, and he'd be like, no, there's, and I'd go, no, we're right here, and he didn't get the break from it. Even if I had to be gently moving his hand, continuing the homework, there was no break. So we went through one homework session from you know where, where we went through half the pencils and we just kept putting it. And I had a therapist there because you can't do this kind of stuff by yourself. And he learned, oh, okay, that's not working. And the pencil thing stopped. Now, in, in a different time from that, not while this was happening, they also were teaching him how to appropriately ask me and say, mom, can I have a break? And then he was able to say, can I take a break? And I was able to say, yes, you can take a break from homework. We're going to set it. You can go play with the Buzz Lightyear for five minutes, and then we have to come back. It all worked, right? But escape maintained behavior happens because the escape worked. And so we need to look at all the different variables and figure out, because different things we have different amount of control over. There's some things where you can't keep jamming a pencil, pencil into their hand, right? Um, but we need to look at all of the different aspects of it to be able to change escape, maintain behavior. But I do want to ask you as a parent, those of you who are parents watching, what escape, maintain behavior are you using with therapy? with dealing with hard situations that you just have been avoiding. Um, you know, I, I'm i very fond of saying to the therapist, don't let the parents, because a lot of us don't like parent training. <laughs> it's just a fact. I don't mean to laugh about it, but it's like not our favorite thing. Because um, we feel like, oh, I'm not good at this. I'm not as good as the 19 year old who comes to my office and is so proficient at it, right? And so we, we, we choose to sort of avoid it, right? And it works for us because we say, oh, I can't do that today. And it works. And the therapist let, up, let us off the hook. But the truth is, it's not what we need in the long run. A lot of times, escape, maintain behavior is avoiding something that you really need. So ask yourself, what can you do to make the parent training better? What can you do, like, is, can you link it up to the fact that your child is gonna make more progress if you do it? And sometimes that's enough. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you have to give yourself a reward for doing it and saying, I'm gonna do the parent training today and afterwards I'm gonna reward myself with X, Y, or Z. I'm gonna go get that manicure that I've been saying I was gonna do. I'm gonna find some time for myself. I'm gonna watch um, the show that I've had on DVR that I haven't been able to see. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, escape, maintain behavior. Moving on, we always have a question for you and our question today, by the way, you can be answering it on Facebook or you can answer it on the live feature or on YouTube, wherever you'd like. Uh, the question is what makes you stay the course when things get difficult? Because this is one of the ways that we get over, under, and through escape, maintain behavior. There are some things that we are, each one of us is good at that we're like, oh, I will persevere um, on that because that's important to me. Or I will 
continue to work on that because I find it enjoyable. Um, but what are the things, what helps you? Some people are goal oriented and they have a picture that they put somewhere that's like, this is what it's going to look like when I'm done. Um, you know, it's some people, it's all internal. Some people, it's all external. But what helps you to stay the course when it gets difficult? I think you're going to find that there's some sort of a reinforcer in it for you. And sometimes, you know what, we talked the other day about the four usual suspects. Sometimes it's one of those. Sometimes it's attention that you know that if you stay the course on this, you're going to get all this positive attention. And that's okay. Sometimes it's, you know that you're going to get access to someone or something, right? If you stay the course, you're going to be able to have money and you're going to be able to buy the thing that you want, whatever that is, right? Sometimes um, if you stay the course, you know that you're going to escape something. Sometimes it's you'll escape poverty because you'll have made money or you'll escape feeling like you didn't complete something, right? Um, and then other times it is just internal, that automatic reinforcing that we talk about that you, you um, persevere um, through something because it feels good to you. Um, the folks who run marathons, you know, I'm sure that there's a element of attention and getting access to medals and stuff, but I think it's a lot that internal, that running on a regular basis, I think has a lot to do with what it feels like. I'm guessing because I'm not one of those people, but I'm guessing that it feels good on the inside. Boy, if you could take that and apply that to other things in your life, whatever it is that feels good, would you be able to work through things that were more difficult? Um, you know, it's possible. I'm always fascinated by um, people who love doing spreadsheets and numbers and find it deeply satisfying. <laughs> Just like, ah. And uh, I had somebody who talked to me yesterday about really not enjoying public speaking. And it's a very enjoyable thing for me. And we both were having this like moment about, boy, you like that? That's what's reinforcing to you. That's not what's reinforcing to me. But you know, it has to be reinforcing to you for you to be able to walk through it. And we can make things more reinforcing and we can pair things with reinforcement. Uh, but what makes you stay the course when things get difficult? What's the thing that helps you to stick to it? We'd love to know on Facebook and I'll, I, we should have some time to check back later on. So uh, we always have a topic of the week and our topic which we launched on Monday this week is all about, I believe, I'm waiting for it, I believe it says functional communication, it does. Um, so I think, you know, I always try to have themes that go together with, with the question and the jargon and everything. Um, and one of the reasons why I paired this with the functional communication is that a lot of times people feel like it's a ginormous bummer when people start talking about functional communication because they feel like, oh, we're not ever going to get to vocal speech. And we know that that isn't the truth, um, that science has shown that the, the individuals who are having trouble speaking are more likely to have challenging behavior out of frustration. Right? And then when we give them functional communication and a way to communicate their needs and wants, that what we find is they become infinitely more teachable, they become infinitely more happy, that they are much more in tune with what's happening because they have a voice. And a voice is always better than no voice. Um, now, that doesn't change that wanting to have vocal speech. Um, at, but in fact, the studies show they are much more likely to get to it and get to it quicker if they are given functional communication. Does everybody have to go through functional communication training? No. If somebody is already at speech, but maybe struggling with speech, then they will double down on speech, right? Because we're already moving down that train. Um, if at a certain point it gets stuck, Maybe then they would introduce functional communication, but the truth is, is that um, when it's really when folks are struggling to get that first little communication, maybe we have sounds, but we don't have words, um, that we really need to shift focus and go, let's go to functional communication because let's get this individual the right to communicate, and then we'll be able to work on those other things. So. Um, in any case, we've gone past time, and I'm just seeing that. We've got a great show for you. We've got Eric Linthorst, who is standing by. 
He's the director of a film that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Autism Goes to College. So, um, and then we're going to be able to hit some questions and do our mindfulness moment today because we haven't gotten to that lately and we, I need it. I don't know about you, but I need a mindfulness moment today. So uh, let's take a break and then let's get right to Eric and talking about Autism Goes to College. Stick with us. Hey, I'm Candace Cameron Bure. Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life including self-control, planning, and problem-solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish, learn, become. Welcome back to Autism Live. Very excited that right now joining us via Skype is the director of the film Autism Goes to College, Eric Linthorst. So Eric, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this is a film that's getting a lot of good buzz. Um, tell us for we had the producer on a couple of weeks ago, but we felt like we really needed to have you on. So tell our audience a little bit about the film and why you think it's getting such good buzz. Uh, so the film Autism Goes to College, it's a documentary and it features five current college students on the autism spectrum. Uh, filmed over one academic year of their lives, uh, the 2017 to 2018 school year, mostly. Um, we have one junior college student, two, uh, one at Cal State Long Beach, one at Cal State Fullerton, and two at UC Riverside. Um, three females, two males, uh, a nice um, ethnic mix, and um, also sort of di very different profiles among the students. So it's a really nice survey of the experience of college, if you are a student with autism spectrum disorder, um, we go into their dorm rooms and into their classrooms, and we talk to their teachers, we talk to them, we talk to their parents, and we talk to some experts to really kind of get a flavor of what is the flow of life like for a student with autism who shows up at college. These are not students who are part of a special program. Some of those programs exist, and those are fantastic. What we were looking at with this project was students who are academically capable of applying and getting in to tier one universities, junior colleges, state colleges, and show up as freshmen, in many cases, having not disclosed their diagnosis on their application, and for a variety of reasons, but the primary one being many of them view college as a fresh start, and they, they want to see if they can um, um, 
you know, approach college with a fresh start and not necessarily with their diagnosis following them. And so that's the population we looked at and we sort of were able to survey, a broad, you know, every aspect of their life, roommates, making friends, dealing with professors, academics, all of it. And so how long is the film? Uh, is it a full length film or is it short? It's a feature documentary. It's 65 minutes in length. Okay. And where can people, because everybody's intrigued, it, everybody that I know that has seen it has said that it's powerful, um, that it's a film that everybody should see. So where can we all go to see it right now? So uh, if you go to our website, autismgoestocollege.org, it's important that you put in the .org to get there. Uh, there's a screenings page that, w that lists all of the, the current and upcoming screenings. Right now, for what we're calling sort of phase one, the only way to see the film is through community screenings, campus screenings at high schools, colleges, and in um, communities that are hosted by nonprofits or individuals. The reason we want to approach phase one of distribution of this film through community screenings is the whole point of the film is to be a conversation starter and to bring the stakeholders together, families who have children in high school who are looking at college, wondering what does this look like, DSS, disability student service counselors, administrators, faculty, professors, and experts. We want to bring these people in the same room so that we can have the kind of robust conversation that uh, we need to have around this topic. And so for that reason, what we're doing is we're, we're recommending um, that you go online to our website if there's not a screening in your area and we're just starting this process of a campus screening tour. So there aren't a lot on the books right now. If you don't see one in your area, uh, consider becoming a host or consider putting us in touch with uh, staff at a local high school uh, or college, junior college, and encouraging them to screen the film so that events like this can take place in communities where uh, our, our people are located that want to see the film. Um, we're doing kind of a, at the start of doing a large outreach campaign through organizations that, uh, that counsel and, and consult with disability student service offices at junior colleges and four-year universities all over the state of California to try to um, have a pretty robust campus screening uh, tour. But you can help by, by sending us an email through our website, expressing your interest in either becoming a host or connecting us with a host. And that right now is the best way to see the film. Yeah, and that's what a great thing to do. I, I know sometimes uh, people have a group in their area, uh, even a small group, what a great thing to do to build your group is to host one of these events, have the, the film come, and, um, and draw people in because there are more people besides you that want to see it. So you mentioned that that was phase one. So, of course, I want to know what's phase two and is there a phase three? Oh, gosh, don't get me started. <laughs> I've got phases as long as the eye can see. Okay, so good. So phase two for, for distribution will look like um, putting it, you know, DVDs, putting it on platforms such as iTunes and Netflix and on um, free television, hopefully PBS, possibly Netflix, things like this. Um, that would be phase two for distribution. Um, but for me, uh, the next phase for the project is the development of a, an online resource center. One of the frustrating things about being a documentary filmmaker is you film 30 hours of interviews and you use maybe 20 minutes of bites from those interviews right. in the film. So we have this stockpile of interviews with professors, with students on the spectrum, their parents, with um, faculty member, DSS counselors. We have this treasure trove of unused interview footage and I wanna use it, I wanna put it somewhere. And so um, I'm putting together a budget and a, a business plan to create use the, this extra footage to create an, a robust online resource center where parents of children in high school uh, or college uh, on the spectrum can go to get great information about how to navigate college, where professors can go to better understand the changing student body and what is neurodiversity, what is an invisible disability, and how they can better um, uh, accommodate students on the spectrum in their classroom. Um, I want to create this online resource center. The problem, of course, is always the same problem I have as an independent filmmaker always, which is financing. 
but I'm putting together a business plan for the university that funded Autism Goes to College to try to encourage them to continue to fund this project. And we're also going to launch a crowdfunding campaign, which is where your viewers and, and stakeholders across the country who are interested in seeing an online resource center like this emerge could contribute you know, $5, $10, $20 to help us uh, towards that goal. That campaign isn't up and running yet, but we hope in the, in the next weeks and months we'll, you'll, we'll be reaching out to people with a, um, a call to action to become a host, to give a little bit, to create this online resource center so that we can move this project out into a larger audience and make it more accessible to more people in more places. Well, it's interesting. I was just about to ask you, how can we help to support? So we'll wait for that. But where can we go so that we know when that's going to be? Is there a uh, All Facebook All information site? will be available on uh, autismgoestocollege.org. But yes, we have a Facebook group, Autism Goes to College on Facebook. I've got, we've got Instagram, Autism Goes to College, the movie uh, account there, and our, we're on Twitter. So we're across social media platforms. Um, and, and really right now, the thing you could do right now is uh, go to our website and um, click the button to get more information on hosting a screening and either pass that information on to somebody at a nonprofit or a junior college or high school uh, who might be able to host a screening or become a host yourself, we're going to make it really easy for folks who are interested in hosting a screening either at a community center or just in their living room or backyard or whatever uh, to, to host community screenings so that we can start to build these community discussions in communities near near your viewers. Love it. Now, Eric, I, you know, I'm, I'm watching you talk about this so passionately and I, I just wonder what is your connection to autism? How did this become something that you would be so passionate about? Uh, yeah, so in 2005, my then two-year-old son was diagnosed on the spectrum, and I began this odyssey that so many parents have, have gone down, my wife and I together, um, exploring what is going on with our child and how do we help him. Um, and that... So I picked up my camera. I was a, a filmmaker, screenwriter at the time, and I picked up my camera and began to film my own experience going to doctor's offices and, and trying to find help for my son and ultimately made a documentary film about that experience called Autistic Like Graham Story. And the title comes from, we would go to this expert and they would say, your son definitely has autism and is probably pretty, you know, severe. And we go to this other expert, they'd say, oh, your child doesn't have autism. He's got, you know, sensory processing disorder. Um, you know, we see this all the time. And then we go to a third expert and they'd say, well, you know, he's sort of autistic-like. And my wife and I would say, well, you can't be pregnant-like. You can't have cancer-like. How can you be autistic-like? Mm. And what are you supposed to do with that? You know, do you, what do you, what treat, what's the treatment when there's no diagnosis and why isn't there a more refined um, series of diagnoses in the DS, DSM manual so that doctors can make diagnoses that are more nuanced because our children, if you look at the five children in my film, Autism Goes to College, you'll see it's hard to believe that all five have the same diagnosis because they're very different individuals and of course they are and my son's different as well. And so anyway, so the film was an exploration of the sort of edge of the autism epidemic. A lot of these sort of gray area kids that are being put on the autism spectrum to get services, mm -hmm. but really just an exploration of that and how to get proper help uh, for your child when uh, the answers you're getting from the experts are anything but clear. Wow. And so can I ask, is it okay to ask how your son is doing now? Sure. Yeah. So. People who are interested in that film, you can go to autisticlike.com. Um, that film has been out for about 10 years and was on PBS and has screened in over 30 countries. Uh, it has Spanish t subtitles um, for, for the um, uh, South American community. We've done an outreach down there. Um, and so that, that film's out and, and is available to people as well. Um, Graham is now 15 and uh, just finished ninth grade and is thriving. He's uh, this summer looking forward to doing junior lifeguards and uh, going to sleepaway camp. And, um, you know, we uh, two years ago had to move him or chose to move him from a large public school to a much smaller private school where he has uh, a support program called the ACE program where he's able to get a little extra help. Um, 
he's a kid who is very bright and uh, doing very well, but also needs structure and has significant um, executive functioning challenges and ADD and sort of, you know, the, the typical cluster of, of challenges uh, that some of these kids have. Wow. Well, but it sounds like he's doing really remarkably, all that yeah. considered. Uh, well, uh, honestly, I I'm so excited uh, now for all of us to go and look at Autistic Like, but excited for people to take the opportunity to um, take a look at Autism Goes to College. I think one of the things that's been interesting about this is there's a whole segment of the autism community that understands that people go to college that are on the spectrum and that they have full rich lives that that's a that's very much a possibility and what we're discovering from you even putting your film out and naming it what you've named it is that a whole bunch of people have gone huh is that possible and it has raised a whole new uh, discussion with people that we didn't realize that, that they needed to have that discussion. And a lot of them are educators. And that's really exciting to me. I have to be honest with you, Eric. I think, I think you've opened a can of worms, and I think it's a good can of worms to open. And I think it's a function of the success of early intervention therapies yes. that this generation of, of young adults with autism are college uh, capable. And the question really is, are the colleges prepared for them? Because they do come with uh, some unique challenges. Um, and there's some very common sense solutions that, frankly, are not being widely implemented. I mean, one of my great frustrations, having um, spent now uh, a year and a half with these students in their lives and talking to the, the disability student services professionals and the professors and the parents, is that you've got these different stakeholders, all of whom have an interest in creating a smooth transition from high school to college for students on the spectrum, and they're not communicating very effectively. There's not great communications in many cases between the disability student services offices and the professors. There's not great communication between the professors and their students who might have invisible disabilities. There's not great communication between the um, high school counselors and the universities um, in, in the best way to prepare these students. Uh, there's not great information for parents, as you say, who have children uh, on the spectrum in high school and maybe never considered that high school was an option, to reach out to them and say, guess what? Uh, it is an option. And it, this is changing. And what we're seeing is a patchwork of solutions cropping up here and there um, but not a lot of communication between those different pilot programs, for example. For example, Cal State Long Beach, where we filmed one student, has a really wonderful program called the Life Project. Cal State Long Beach has a, a program called the Life Project that is for students on the spectrum. It teaches life skills. Um, it offers mentor peer coaching from, from other students, graduate students typically. And it's a really wonderful program. Now, they're considering such a program at UC Riverside. But UC Riverside has not spoken to the, the, the powers at uh, Cal State Long Beach to sort of say, hey, what's worked best? What hasn't worked? You know, how can, how can we learn from what you're doing? So I think there needs to be more sort of cross-pollination with some of these good ideas. Uh, my son's high school, for example, did have a night recently for parents where they said uh, they brought in representatives from universities that had support programs for students with learning disabilities or some types of special needs. Uh, to pitch their program. It's a wonderful idea. Uh, the problem was there was only a couple of universities that showed up and there were only a couple of parents that showed up. So there wasn't a great deal of communication around uh, bringing in a larger crop of representatives from universities and programs and getting the word out so that more parents could show up and learn. So I think it's really the challenge is more of a communication one than an ideas one at this point. Uh, isn't that interesting? And, and I have to say that doing a film uh, is going to, honestly, when you think about all the things that you can do to bring something into light so people start to communicate, a film is a great way to do it. So we really think that this is uh, an amazing, worthwhile project. We want to encourage people um, that where you want to go is autismgoestocollege.org to stay tuned in and to find out more about what's happening and to support this effort. 
And remember, there's a couple of things happening. Uh, just to paraphrase what you were saying, Eric, that not only will there be a crowdfunding um, that will be eventually so that we can help support being able to see all that extra footage, all that great information that you have going, but there's also the idea that you could host a showing of this film in your home, in your backyard, in your community, um, and that that's a way that you can help to bring this to light um, and benefit from it because having the families and the individuals and the educators and the educational institutions uh, talking about this is just a beneficial thing. So Eric, I, I'm just very impressed and uh, I can't wait to see the film and we're all excited for you guys and excited for the level of conversation that is coming from this. Thank you so much um, for being the awesome dad that you are, but for also being the awesome filmmaker that you are. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing with, with folks. And uh, I should also add that if you are, it, part of the arrangement for hosting a screening is that you can use that as an opportunity to fundraise for your organization, school, or program. So um, that's part of the arrangement. So there's some added benefits for uh, prospective hosts to, to consider hosting an event. What a wonderful, what a great idea, taking care of a whole bunch of things at the same time adding to your organization, shedding good light and publicity on your organization, building the conversation, and raising money for your organization at the same time. I absolutely love it. There's no reason not to do it. Go to autismgoestocollege.org to sign up to do, do that. Eric, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to look forward to seeing you at a screening very soon. Great. Thank you very much. Have thank a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, you guys, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back with some questions that you guys had written in and some answers. I did get an answer um, from uh, a BCBA about one, and then we're going to look at some of the other ones that I can answer as well, and we're going to do a mindfulness while it. So stick with us. Back after these messages. Hi, Lisa Ackerman back with Talk of Facts. Questions, real-life questions and answers for the autism journey. Oh, are you ready for this one? Talk to me about puberty. Ah! So what I would recommend is first and foremost is the kids that have done the therapeutics, the medical, and the dietary allergen removal interventions tend to have an easier time at puberty. Seizures are really common uh, for children on the spectrum more than neurotypical populations, and they're especially most common right at or about puberty time. So it's extremely important, even if you have a 10-year-old that you've already done an EEG, that you consider before they go through puberty to get a second EEG done. Just because you have one clean EEG with no abnormal brain activity or seizure activity, you need to do another one prior to puberty. That's one of the most common calls we get with teens on the spectrum is they are often experiencing a seizure for what their family thinks is the first time. And the third thing is you're going to have a teenager, so you're really going to have to kick it up a notch on those life skills, social skills, and getting your kid ready to be that teenager they need to be. So if you're doing that baby thing, and I know you are, where you're maybe making their lunches or uh, helping them with laundry, we need to start bouncing some chores over to those kids. And we also need to increase social environments where they can be successful. So think about it. We've got three really important things that we need to look at. Puberty is a very serious issue and we take it very seriously. So make sure you have all of your therapeutics, medical and dietary interventions in place. Uh, consider to do another 24 hour EEG with your physician prior to puberty. And the third most important thing, get ready to raise the bar. Your job is to really get them ready for life. And I know you can do it. Welcome back to Autism Live. I wanted to uh, quickly address, we had a mom who wrote in 
Um, she'd written in last week, and I, I answered part of it for our West Virginia mom, but I'm going to re-answer it because I don't think you saw that. And then I had a BCBA give me an answer to the other part of your question. So uh, the question was, hello, this is West Virginia mom. I had a question about both of my kids, actually. My son is five, high functioning, and while giving him a bath, we were working on him washing himself, and he washed the left side of his body with his left hand and the right side with his right, and then I realized he can't cross the midline. Now, we had talked about this the other day on the show because you had written in and uh, the reason why I asked for your address is because I have a DVD that I'm going to send you. Joanne Lara from Autism Movement Therapy actually created a DVD um, of exercises for kids and a lot of it is crossing the midline. And what we see when you, and by the way, I also said for everybody that I'm not sending a video, you can go on Pinterest and put in children crossing the midline and you'll come up with a bunch of different exercises um, to be able to do that. Um, and cross it, crossing the midline for people who don't know, it's when, you know, so if the phone is sitting over here and my, I'm holding something in this hand and you say to me, can you pick up the phone? Well, I have to cross my body to pick up the phone, right? And for, there are some kids though, who will put this pen down and pick it up with this hand and the notion of picking it up with the other one, just, you know, they, it's really hard and they don't do it. Um, and we need for people to cross the midline um, because it's helpful with all kinds of things that happen in the brain. Now, mom is asking specifically, um, uh, I know his low tone doesn't help his writing, uh, but um, will not being able to cross the midline affect his handwriting and ability to read? And the truth is, is that we're finding out all the ways that crossing the midline helps because it helps with cognition and with executive functions. And um, so one of the things that I suggested, because I know that you're an awesome on it mom and does a lot of art activities with your kiddos during the summer is check out the book from the library drawing on the right side of the brain because there are exercises in helping the brain to cross over um, and being able to do things right-handed left-handed upside down there's really cool uh, drawing exercises that I think uh, will have the potential to help and then see what happens. Um, but I'm going to send you that DVD as well. But then she also says, my daughter is seven, ending first grade and on a second grade reading level. Now that she can read large words and fluently, she has to sound out small world words like his, it, and she. I don't know what to do for these, and I'm baffled that she can read words like tremendous, yesterday, and situation, but not it. Any input is much accepted and love you all. So I reached out to one of our BCBAs, Cecilia Knight, and um, she had a little bit to say about the crossing the midline too. So I'm going to read that to you really quickly and then I'm going to read you about the other. So crossing the midline, she says there are ex exercises that can be implemented to work on this. Sometimes OT or PT will do this. And is he getting those services? If he is low tone, he may need to be evaluated for OT and or PT for strengthening. There are exercises that mom can work on to strengthen core. I imagine there are some exercises on crossing the midline on the internet as well. And, and honestly, Pinterest is the answer, answer to most questions. Uh, this is a well-documented issue with our population of kids. Crossing the midline is something to work on, and it does impact many things. Okay, great. And then for the other part of the question for your daughter, she says, it is interesting. Some of the high-frequency words are ones that we see kids actually skipping over and not really attending to whereas the harder words require full attention and even sounding out. It does seem pretty counterintuitive, but I've seen this before. If the child is in ABA, they can isolate the he, she, uh, and other missed words and work on them until they're mastered. I would make a list of the high frequency words and start targeting them one by one. We really want kids to have high frequency words memorized so that they don't have to take the time to sound them out. And, and like there are ABA programs about this, but you know, it can be as simple as flashcards. Um, there are lists again on Pinterest of the high frequency words and um, for most kids, teachers try to teach them to sound them out. So hopefully that helps. Um, I hope that um, 
and we just want to say hi to everybody who's watching us on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, for the other question that came in about the heavy breathing, I'm still waiting on a, on a question from a different BCBA that I asked. So uh, we've only got five minutes left, and what a better way to end today's show than... Uh, doing a little mindfulness moment. So on Thursdays, we sort of prioritize. We should be doing mindfulness every single minute uh, and every single show, right? Uh, if we want to reduce stress, that is. So I told you that I went to a conference in January and there was a gentleman, I wish I could think at the moment what his name is because he's a world-renowned expert in mindfulness and autism, right? Uh, but I cannot think of the name at the moment, forgive me. So, but he did a workshop and was talking about mindfulness and he showed a study after study after study that said how effective mindfulness and meditative practices are with, in conjunction with using ABA. And he showed it not only for working with the kids and that the kids made more progress, but he showed it with the parents and that the parents uh, said that they had less anxiety, which you have to figure that becomes a loop, right? If the parent has less anxiety, it means they're more available to help on the ABA team, which means the ABA gets better, which means the parent is feeling better, and then it goes up and up and up and up and up, right? So um, I, I, one of the things, though, that I was like, oh, no, because I thought, oh, well, we've been working on mindfulness for years, and we, you know, have this mindfulness moment on Thursdays. We're so far ahead of the curve. But one of the things that I went, oh, maybe we're not, is that he said that the level of benefit that you get from a meditative practice when you get to 20 minutes, that it's skyrockets. It's so much more beneficial to you if you can get in 20 minutes whenever you're practicing it. And the more you can do that, the better. And that then you want to work up to an hour. And I thought, oh, we've been working on three breaths. That's not 20 minutes, right? Um, so I really want to encourage you to find in your day uh, a 20-minute time period. And I know it's tough. But one of the places where it might be beneficial and might actually help with things is a lot of us, when we finally do get to bed and it's time to lay down in the bed and go to sleep, sleep is not available, right? Because we're cycling through the day and we're reliving moments and going, oh my gosh, I didn't do this, or you know what I got to do tomorrow, and we start stacking, right? And then we're wide awake, and or if we do drop off to sleep, it's sleep with nightmares and, you know, those repetitive dreams where you're just not getting anything done, Oy, right? So what if when you go to bed, instead of picking up like so many people do the device and going through Facebook or playing a game or something, what if that became part of your meditative time? Uh, what if, and you can still, if you need to use the phone, there are a lot of free meditations that talk you through a meditation um, on iTunes. Some of them are, are for a cost. Um, but you know, there are a lot just on the internet that you can download, whether it's iTunes or other that you can get. We have a free meditation that's available. That's 11 minutes. I didn't know about the 20 minute thing, right? Uh, and maybe we'll re-record and get to 20 minutes, but excuse me. Now I have the hiccups. Um, but in any case, you can find them online. Now, some people like to be talked through a meditation because they find it difficult um, because what ends up happening, and I'm one of those people, that you know, you're trying to meditate and free your mind and just go to a white space, but then here comes the thought, right? <laughs> and you go, oh, there's that thought. Oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to let that go. Right, now I'm meditating. Here comes another thought, right? It's easier for me if somebody is putting thoughts in and I've got something to attend to. Now, you will find, as a lot of us do, that you will go to sleep. And I got to tell you, if that's what happens right now, it's okay. Because that means you really need the sleep. And sleep comes before almost everything else. So even if you put on a meditative thing or you think a meditative thought or you focus on a word and you meditate on that and three seconds in you go to sleep, well, that's a benefit. Um, eventually you will get caught up in sleep enough that you will be able to stay awake for a couple of minutes and then you can build to 20 minutes and eventually we can get to the one hour. 
Um, but I think it's important to make the time for it. So um, that's our meditative, mindful uh, moment for today is that we're going to eat towards the 20 minutes. And I do think, I do think if you have no other time in the day that the when you go to bed is the best time to approach it unless you've got other time. Um, and then do it when it's best for you. But if there's, if there's just no time and you're like, Shannon, the schedule is packed, when you lay down, when you lay the bones down in the bed, give yourself whatever it is that some people like one word, some people just like to picture snow, other people like to have somebody talking to them. It's all good. There's no wrong. All right, we're out of time. I, they're getting the hook. I got to go. We'll be back tomorrow with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We've got a great show for you. You're not going to want to miss it. We've got the fabulous Kimberly Kaplan with us, and she's an autism mom and an author with a brand new book out about Monty Hall. It's a really fun read. So check it out, and she's going to tell us about her other books that have more to do with autism. So Let's talk autism tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.